Welcome to J-Life with Daniel. I'm your host, Rabbi Daniel Avin. Okay, well, we're now sitting after a couple weeks after the fifth Israeli election now in three years. And here to dissect all the results, we have our returning champion, Dr. Alon Burstein. For those who remember previous episodes, Dr. Alon Burstein is a UCI professor in the poli sci department teaching classes on Zionism, Israel, and terrorism. Alon, welcome back to J-Life with Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be here. So there's a lot we could talk about in terms of these elections. First and foremost, perhaps that we actually have some concrete results. It seems that Bibi Netanyahu and the sort of wider right wing to far right coalition is actually going to be in government probably in the next couple of weeks. Before we get into any questions about the specifics, why do you think the results here were actually different than previously when it was sort of this stalemate 60-60? It's a great question because most of the polls were actually showing that the stalemate was going to continue. Um, And in fact, the actual popular vote does show that the stalemate continued. The difference between the parties that pledged to go with Netanyahu, so the yes Netanyahu camp, and the parties that were in the opposing camp, which has little in common, so we'll just call it the opposing Netanyahu camp, the difference in the popular vote was less than 30,000 votes at the end. It was 0.64%. The reason that the final results and the seats in the Knesset show a very different story is because two parties on the anti-Netanyahu side, so Meretz, which is considered the socialist, Jewish, or Zionist party, and Balad, which is considered the far most either left or depending on how we would classify it, Arab-Israeli party, fell below the threshold. And because they fell below the threshold, all of their votes effectively got lost. And thus, the actual results in seats reflect a much greater victory for Netanyahu's camp than actually the popular vote would have. If we went just by the popular vote, you would have the exact same 60-60 deadlock. So given that that's obviously not what happened, and you know we can probably endlessly pontificate about sort of the left, both in Israel and America, just being worse at politics and coalitions and sort of infighting, you know, the right typically is able to sort of all get down one candidate or one path, whereas with the left, I think it just happens in liberalism in general, right? If you're trying to conserve something, it's easier to all get behind one thing, whereas once you open the door to liberalism, there's a seemingly infinite number of ways that you can go to change society. I want to hone in a little bit because I think that the most important news story and one that we've certainly been hearing a lot about, and I think we're actually going to be hearing a lot more about in the next couple of years, is the Religious Zionist Party. Just a little bit of background for those who don't know, Religious Zionist Party is a party, it's sort of a amalgamation of other smaller parties, all cross sections of the far right, and they got 14 out of 120 seats. So that roughly amounts to about between 11 and 12%. I hope I did that math right. And probably the most important story of this news cycle is a guy named Itamar Ben-Gavir, who some are calling a Jewish supremacist, others are calling sort of a neo kahanist who is now in an extremely powerful position in the government. Just for our listeners who have never heard of Ben-Gavir or who might have heard of him sort of in passing, reading the news, who is Itamar Ben-Gavir and why have we been hearing so much about him? So I'll say a couple of things about Ben-Gavir specifically, and then maybe we'll go back to the religious Zionist party and why it's making so much news. So Itamar ben has for years been sort of marked as the most far right element within Israeli politics. He historically is a follower of the Kahanist movement and was part of the Kahanist movement. Um, he was a great supporter of Baruch Goldstein who committed the massacre uh, in Hebron against killing 30 Muslims in 1994. Um, He has a long track record of supporting violence, and he is actually the only Knesset member who's ever, who, he's the only member of the Knesset who has ever been indicted and found guilty of supporting a terror group because he distributed Kahanist and the Kafa movement's propaganda. Um, Just a couple of statistics, he has 53 indictments in his history, eight criminal convictions, including incitement for racism and spreading propaganda for terror groups. Um, he famously, before Robin's assassination, um, went on TV when he was 19 years old, if I'm not mistaken, or possibly 18 years old, showing the symbol of Robin's car and, and saying, just like we managed to rip the symbol off the car, we'll get to him. 
Similarly, he put stickers on Sharon's car saying, Sharon, we're coming for you because of the disengagement. And this is Ariel Sharon, the prime minister of Israel in the early 2000s, who famously pulled out of Gaza. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, and and the, the, list go, the list goes on and on. In, the, in recent years, he joined the foundation of a party that is called sort of Jewish Power. Um, and that party started to gradually advocate for importing Kahanist ideas, which are essentially that Israel should be a land solely for the Jews, governed by Jews, for Jews. And the list can go on and on about how you deprive Arab and Arab Israelis of any rights in the country. So so what would you say, sorry to, to cut you off here. See, it, it's nice to do a podcast in person because I could see that you don't want me to cut you off and I still do it anyway. <laughs> what would you say to those? I'm, I'm just going to sort of play devil's advocate, right? Because there's obviously a large, like a large percentage of Jews in Israel are voting for him, right? When we say that he got 11% of the vote, that's with 20% of the population in Israel being Arab. So and I'm assuming not a lot of Arabs voted for him. This is about 15 to 16% of Jewish votes in Israel, not to mention a lot of American Jewish supporters who probably don't see what's wrong with this sort of Kahanist ideology. What would you say, I'm, I'm going to just throw a couple of hypotheticals here because these are all conversations that I've had with friends of mine and people in my wider circle who either themselves are supporting or know somebody who sort of supports this type of ideology. Let's get with the sort of easiest first and then we'll go hardest. <laughs> what would you say to people who said that Ben Gavir obviously went through some sort of personal transformation? Anybody can dig up videos of you know us when we were 18, 19, doing and saying stupid things. And actually there was a video that came out of Ben Gavir post getting elected, talking to supporters, saying that he actually is not pro deporting Arabs, met with you know boos and jeers from the crowd. But pe- what if people are saying this and saying, you know, in his youth, he was sort of immature. And now, you know, yes, he's still right wing, but he's sort of grown up. And now he's sort of playing normative politics just with a further right bent than perhaps we're used to. So I'd say a couple of things. Um, it's possible to say that when you were younger, you were a hothead and you matured since then. Ben Gvir um, boasted and used to show pictures that he had of Baruch Goldstein, again, the terrorist from the Tomb of the Patriarchs, um, in his living room until the year 2020. Um, and he took it down, again, explicitly, according to his own volition, only because that would be easier for Netanyahu to put him in government if he did not have that picture up. Similarly, it is true that he has asked his supporters to stop chanting death to Arabs and instead chant death to terrorists. However, it is noteworthy that he has consistently, including in a tweet yesterday, called all Arab MKs terrorists and said that the terrorist Ahmed Tibi, for example, is consider- is continuing to support our enemies and et cetera, et cetera. So it is difficult to say that he has actually gone through any form of moderation other than in rhetoric that would allow him to come into mainstream. Most of his actual actions, most of his policy suggestions, most of, if you actually dissect the nuances of what he says and what he says to his supporters, do not support that hypothesis. One thing that I will add also, just because you suggested, and this maybe will, I know you're not going to let me do this now, maybe we'll go back to this later, um, when you said that like such a large percentage of the Jewish population voted for him, it is noteworthy that his party, Otsmaya Hudit, Jewish power, never managed to pass the threshold by itself. Now, this time it likely would have with nine colors, but it ran in several different election campaigns before and did not manage to pass. What what won was, as you said, the religious Zionist party, which is a conglomeration of other parties also that joined together to have a lot of radical, of extreme right-wing messages, and they managed to garner as much support. So the vote is not only for him, and that is noteworthy. No, of course. And so if we're sort of thinking about this, I guess, in in theories of concentric circles, we sort of have in the middle of the circle, the hardcore, you know, they love all the kahanisness about Ben Gavir. Maybe they're even a little bit more extreme than he is, you know, upset that he isn't, you know, straight up saying we should expel Arabs or worse, you know, that might amount to, you know, whatever percent, but probably a small, smaller percent. Probably if we grow out, and this is certainly people that I've talked to, people who maybe they don't even like the more radical elements, but they think that Ben Gavir is going to be best for internal security, right? Israel has seen an uptick of internal terrorism. And when I say internal terrorism, just for the listeners, I don't mean terrorism coming out of the West Bank. I don't mean rockets being launched from Gaza. 
What I mean by in the last couple of years is inside Israel, there's been a record increase of terrorism coming from Arab Israeli citizens, right? So people who think that Ben Gavir might protect against there, all the way to if we keep on going out, people who sort of generally identify with the Datilumi religious Zionist ethos and maybe aren't even following politics and see on their ballot religious Zionist and say, oh yeah, I'm a religious Zionist and put the uh, check mark there. Um, in terms of politics in general, I feel like there's there's oftentimes this, this wider question of, I don't want to say how much fault, but to what extent does this, I guess, change our picture of Israeli society? Is this just sort of a casualty of the consistent rightward swing of Israeli politics that all of a sudden somebody like Ben Gavir is going to become normalized and even a lot of the more hateful elements of the rhetoric are, oh yeah, that's just something on the side or does this represent an actual shift in wider Israeli view towards Arabs? You know, what do you chalk this up to be? So, first of all, you're absolutely right. You never hear me saying that so often. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> you're absolutely right um, that the increase in sort of internal intercommunal violence. I would not necessarily call it internal terrorism from um, Arab Israelis, not because I don't want to call it by, that by name, just because statistically that's not actually, there has not been actually that much of an increase. What there was is in May, 2021, there was a explosion as is well known between Israel and Hamas. Um, and this bred into the Arab Israeli population, and there were lots of internal communal riots between Arabs and Jews, and between Jews and Arabs within Israel. Those aren't necessarily marked as an increase in terrorism from Arab Israelis because there were riots on both sides. But what that did do is entirely undermine the sense of security that Israelis or Jewish Israelis may have had in thinking, well, the problem with the Palestinians is dealt with with the IDF, but internally, there's some sort of understanding with the Arab Israelis or we can all live in peace. And in the joint cities in the, or in the cities that have both a high Arab and Jewish population like Lod or Akko or things like that, there was this major outburst of violence. That happened a year ago. This is the first election since then. That had a major impact on people signaling out this need for someone like Itamar ben to say it's not about fighting the Palestinians. It's not just religious Zionism. The idea of bringing about this idea of Jewish dominance over the land is not just about solidifying settlements in the territories. It is also actually has to be turned back to, we need to reassert the Zionist Jewish ideal within Israel itself against Arabs within Israel itself. That shift is a very real shift. Alongside that, a couple of contextual things did happen to make this election particularly a favorable one for Ben Gvir. Chief among them is that Netanyahu is fighting for his political life. And in the present time, he was leading the opposition. And it didn't, like I said, it looked like it was going to be another deadlock. And a lot of his allies had already joined with the anti-Netanyahu camp. So sort of his traditional allies, like Bennett, the former prime minister, or Gidon Saar, or Lieberman, all of these people had sort of turned against him. And thus he needed to solidify another camp someone else who would be within his camp that would ensure that he would manage to become prime minister again. So from two years ago, when in order to make sure he did not, that Netanyahu did not alienate his potential voters, he went online shouting everywhere possible, Ben Gvir will not be a minister. He will not be in my government. He's not worthy of it. All of a sudden this election, he was saying, I have no problem with that. Ben Gvir is going to be a minister. He's going to be minister of internal security. He's a fine person. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So that all, those two things came together in the last year to really give Ben Gavir this push of legitimacy within and, the right. And there's been a sort of normalization of Ben Gavir, both from internal political mechanisms and also from external, right? Or they're probably playing off of each other. In in a second, I want to try to make a both universalistic and then also a Jewish case against against Ben Gavir. But before we do that, I I think it's worth pointing out, and I'm curious if this will you know get any sort of reaction. This type of ideology, right, whether the Khanist ideology or Ben Gavir, is both against the fundamental ethos of Zionism, right? If we read Herzl or Achad Am, right, of course, two figures who probably did more than anything to shape the ethos and philosophy of Zionism, even if we read the writings of Zeb Jabotinsky, who's sort of seen as the intellectual father of the right of the sort of revisionist Zionist movement in the early 20th century, all the way to, if we read early religious Zionistic literature, if we actually read Rav Cook or the late Aaron Lichtenstein, 
None of them talked about people who weren't Jewish like this. If anything, a lot of early Zionist thinkers, again, both the secular socialist Zionism of Herzl and Achada Am, or even the religious Zionism of Ralph Cook and Ralph Lichtenstein and their ilk, actually chalked up the sort of success of Zionism to specifically be the place that can cultivate a multicultural environment that can actually, quote unquote, protect the minority, right, in the secular language, or protect the stranger for we were once strangers in Egypt, to quote the religious language that Rev Cook and Rev Lichtenstein used to talk about. What's happening? Is this just sort of part of the global trend of countries just going continuously right wing that's being brought about by probably the fear stoking of social media and everything like that? Or is this something more intrinsic to Israel that you think is happening? I think it's obviously a combination, um, which you know does not give you an obvious easy answer. Um, I think in general, we are seeing a greater trend across the world. And we see this in parties coming up in Italy and in Germany and in France and even in the UK with Brexit and you know, Trumpism, like we've seen a great turn towards a, a return to some sort of romanticized nationalism when back in the good old days, it was we America for Americans, we were fighting in the right way and that that's all been lost because of the liberals and things like that. So there is this general swing that builds on a lot of this international trend. Um, noteworthy is that Viktor Orban was the first person to call Netanyahu to congratulate him after the elections, for example, the leader of Hungary. At the same time, we do see things that are particular contextual in the Israeli case. We do see this sort of all of a sudden connection between a movement that, as you say, did not reflect the original ideas of religious Zionism, a movement that started to grow more and more in the last 20 years in the West Bank, in the, in the Palestinian territories, and trying to assert some sort of idea of Jewish supremacy there. And that merging in the right ways and the right time with the Kahanist ideas, which claimed that you need to assert Jewish supremacy across the land, including in Israel proper. Where this comes from, it is just a development of the current context and the fall of Oslo and sort of the lack of hope that anyone has in Israel for some sort of settlement. I remind you when Kahana ran himself in the Knesset in the 1980s, he did not get more than one seat. He was banned from the president's house who refused to sit with him. He was outlawed originally from running at all. So we're seeing a combination of things. We're seeing also this rising international trend that more and more people are willing to accept turn a blind eye, we may not like that form of politics, but let's face it, we need security, we need a border in the south with Mexico, we need whatever, all these writers are like, we don't like it, but you know what, okay, let's just close our eyes and vote for him, on the one hand. And on the other hand, we are seeing very contextual things that have occurred in Israel in the last 15 15 years that have really driven a lot of the Jewish population to say, you know what, there's no sense in clinging to the hope that we're ever going to get along with the Palestinians or ever going to get along with the Arabs. So let's stop being, you know, pretty about it. Let's stop, you know, twisting our words or being politically correct. Let's just call it. We need someone to come here and show the Arabs who's boss. Yeah. And just to fill in just some of those names for, for our, our listeners, <laughs> you know, Mayor Kahana, the American born rabbi who ended up moving to Israel. You know, he has actually a very interesting story that in a lot of ways mirrors a lot of both American and Israeli late 20th century century Judaism. I mean, he was quite the popular figure, both when he was alive and actually now posthumously, obviously, you know, still in some circles. He was sort of famous and infamous for, of course, running for Knesset, getting one out of 120 seats at that time in Israel. The threshold for getting into government was actually a lot lower. He comes in, you know, on a platform of basically expelling the Arabs. And every time he gets up to speak in the Knesset, I believe it's everybody else you know, sort of either left the building or, you know, made some motion to signal that they weren't listening. And then, of course, right right after he runs, Israel passes a basic law, which is basically Israel's version of a ever-changing constitution. We'll, we'll call it that, to basically ban any party with explicitly racist ideology from running, basically, you know, effectively closing the door on another run from Kahana. So one thing I'm going to, um, this time I'm going to cut you off. Perfect. Um, and just um, fill in a couple of blanks there. Yes, it is true that after uh, Kahana got the Knesset, that's when they added um, this article 7A to the basic law that says that you cannot run a party in the Knesset if you deny Israel as either a Jewish or a democratic state. 
And the reason that that would be enough of a threshold to stop Khanna from coming in is because his platform was, and studies showed this, was basically a a copy-paste of the Nuremberg laws that the Nazis had against the Jews with a replacement of Jew for Arab. So among things in his platform were there must be separate beaches. Jews will not be in Arabs uh, next to Arabs and beaches. If there are sexual relations between Jews and Arabs, such people will be arrested. If there are, and the list goes on and on and on, that really mirrors the Nuremberg laws one to one. So it's not just that, not that you were belittling it at all, but it's not just that it was a platform of racism. It was really a, such an extreme version and something that also when this came out and when it was seen in the fringe of the fringe, when he got in, it sent such shockwaves through the Israeli system. How could this happen? As you were saying, this is the Zionist land that's a vision that's supposed to incorporate everyone. How could it be that he can even manage to get into Knesset? Here we are 40 years later, his disciple, who openly is his disciple, who went to his memorial the day after the elections, is now destined to be the Minister of Interior Defense. So this gets us actually to, I guess, an interesting question about democracy. One of the other things that that I hear all the time, especially from friends of mine in Israel and family of mine in Israel, whenever I comment on Israeli politics, is basically me as an American Jew, or I'll say you as a Israeli Jew who has consciously decided to leave Israel, who cares what we have to say? Meaning we have no right to an opinion. We haven't, you know, we're not going to have children that are going to serve in the IDF unless we move there. We are not going to bear the brunt of terrorism. We don't pay taxes in Israel. So basically, you know, who cares what the American Jewish community has to say, right? Basically, you know, if we want to support Israel, great. We can sort of funnel money and donations or in lobbying the American government to help. But anytime, you know, something Israel does is negative, basically nobody wants to hear from us. As somebody who I guess until a couple years ago lived in Israel, what do you sort of think of this wider argument that I think is becoming increasingly popular among people in Israel? I think it's becoming increasingly popular, and I think that it represents a lot of the sort of schizophrenia within um, Israeli identity and Jewish identity, but not just Jewish. Also, the Arab Israelis have split identities also between identifying as Arabs, identifying as Israelis, identifying as Palestinians, identifying as Muslims or sometimes Christians, etc. Among the Jewish population, there is this constant split between, on the one hand, this inherent expectation that every Jew in the world must support Israel, right or wrong. It must support Israel, it must give its money to Israel, it must give its support to Israel, it should send people to serve in the Israeli army, it should lobby its governments, it should all these things. On the other hand, who are you to comment about Israel? Who are you to say, well, w- w- as all the reasons you just said, I'm not going to try to repeat them, all the reasons you just said about why should you have an opinion? And this split identity is very, very common, or split demands, I would say. Yeah, well, it's very it, common among a lot of specifically right wing America, no, right wing Israelis. Um, and I will just add that it's very typical also of its relationship to the Amer- of their relationship, their expectation to the American government. That whereas on the one hand, there is this constant expectation that the United States will veto anything in the UN that is against Israel, will continuously send Israel annually well over $3 billion in defense, will continuously block any other attempts in The Hague or anything to attack Israel on the one hand. On the other hand, who is the United States to tell Israel to stop settlements? Who is the United States to tell Israel that you should enter negotiating with the Palestinians? Who are they? Why should we even listen to them? This duality in expectations of the Americans, whether it's the American Jewry or the American government is very typical. And of course, the sort of uh, chief casualty of this is a lot of people in Israel are increasingly looking at the sort of Christian fundamentalist world, you know, the evangelical world who both in their lobbying and in terms of charitable donations are basically a much heavier weight in terms of their punch, in terms of just voting population of America, and increasingly basically saying some version of screw those liberal Jews in America, we don't need them, we have 30% of America evangelical Christian, and they will basically support us financially, politically, and, you know, with whatever else we need, no matter what we do. Um, yeah, they're, I'll just add, they're, they're replacing the expectation of the North American Jew to say, but it's Israel, right or wrong, it's Israel, we support it. So the evangelical Christians are replacing 
the North, the liberal North American Jew, and as far as the Israeli government is concerned, and we saw this also, also specifically with Netanyahu throwing his weight into the Republican Party and sort of abandoning the Democratic Party a little bit, saying, right, because now we have a base of support that's not necessarily Jewish, but still, Israel, mm-hmm. right or wrong? Well, you even see this with a lot of, uh, you know, I think Trump, I mean, he's not tweeting, he's truth socialing, if we can, <laughs> if we can use such a verb. And he's basically, you know, over the past couple of weeks, said something akin to American Jews aren't fighting for the right team. I'm the most pro-Israel president mm-hmm. ever. Absolutely. They better get behind me and support me. And then he said, like, before it's too before late it's or, too or late. else, yes. whatever, whatever that means. I don't think that's an actual threat. I think it's just Trump, you know. But it doesn't sound good. It doesn't sound great. It doesn't sound great. But I don't want to sound like, you know, we're overly straw man and oh, my God, Trump is openly threatening because, you know, uh, the going going back, you know, two minutes just to this wider idea of whether or not American Jews have, quote unquote, the right, whatever that means, to have an opinion about Israel. This does amount to a sort of paradox of sort, because, of course, Israel, Zionism, certainly right wing Zionism is predicated on an idea that Judaism and Zionism are fundamentally connected, meaning it is impossible, right? And I actually grew up in religious Zionist circles. I went to B'nai Akiva my entire life, right? Am Israel, Be'eretz Israel, al Pitarat Israel, right? The nation of Israel, the land of Israel, the Torah of Israel, these, you know, three points of a triangle cannot be disconnected. In that case, it's, it's strange then to almost discount what half the Jewish world wants to say about Israel. I mean, it, it's sort of this this weird picking and choosing in a way that even within a sort of right wing nationalist religious Zionist ideology, I actually don't think is, is consistent. You know, there's a, I'm, I'm going to completely butcher, butcher the line of Midrash here, but the Midrash is sort of um, commenting on after the Israelites sin with the golden calf and God basically offers Moshe a second chance. And Moshe famously says, you know, if you're going to do away with the Jewish people, erase me from your Torah. And the Midrash basically comments, you either want the Jewish people or you don't, right? <laughs> no, but meaning it's 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 comedic, but to some extent you can't say we need this land because it's so important for the Jewish people. And oh, by the way, we only care about what about 20% of the Jewish people that agree with us care about, right? Which, you know, is strange because in some way, I mean, it's really difficult in terms of this religious Zionist camp to neatly dissect out where religion ends and politics begins or vice versa. I mean, this is sort of probably an endless historical difficulty in terms of exactly how to neatly slice them too. But just just sort of thinking of this in a wider Jewish context, I mean, it's deeply, not just universally troubling. I think anybody that's sort of a universalist, even if they're a one percent of a universalist, can understand why Itamar ben Gavir and his ilk is troubling. Let's tackle this from just a Jewish perspective. Let's say we are starting with the premise, a premise that neither of us share, but let's say For the purpose of this conversation, for the next 10 minutes, me and you only care about Jewish lives. We only care about Israel remaining a Jewish state and all other considerations are basically completely zero, right? Let's let's accept some of the premises of people in, you know, at least the extreme elements of these right-wing circles. What then would you think of Itamar Ben-Gavir? Meaning with all this rhetoric, with all of the laws that he might do as the sort of police chief who he might become in a couple of weeks. Is this good for the security of Israel? Forget all long-term concerns, forget what the UN is going to say. Internally, as a Jew living in Israel, will this help or hurt security-wise? So I'd say that I would be arguably more fearful of him in that case uh, for two reasons. One is if all I care about is Jewish lives and Israel being a homeland for the Jews and nothing but the Jews to help us God. Um, yeah, we are, we are for right. the purposes of the conversation, so, Jewish supremacists. So then know. first of all, one of the things that's often chastised against a lot of extremist rhetoric of just vote for me and, you know, it'll be great. Like, okay, well, what's going to happen? Are the immigrants that are threatening us going to disappear? Are you going to put them into concentration camps or gas chambers? What are you going to do? Like the fact remains that there are two to three to four, depending on how we count exactly where, million Palestinians living with on the borders with Israel in Gaza and the, and the West Bank, on the borders or within the borders. And whether you care about their lives or not, making their lives more miserable historically has meant that more Jews will die. 
historically it has meant the more you suppress them, the more there will be waves of terrorism, the more there will be reactions, there will be a backlash, and that means more Jews will die. So from that point of view alone, it's not good for the Jews. At the same time, the bigger reason why I would say it's a problem, because in theory, his answer could be, yes, I'm going to put them in concentration camps. So there, problem solved, right? Because we only care about the Jews at this point. And just to be clear, Ben Gavir has not said that he's going to do this, right? You are just using a, oh, yeah, a, yeah. a thought experiment, just I in case people, people saying, misunderstand what we're doing here. However, what he has said, or him and his party have said, is that leftist Jews are traitors. He has said that liberal Jews are traitors. He has said, and again, him and his party, some of these quotes are people who are saying our party stands for, people he can't pick for his party. He has said that reform Judaism is not real and that people who have, a, for example, a reform conversion are not considered Jews. So from that point of view also, if we just if we abandon security for a second and just say concretely, if we were saying, is this good for the entirety of the Jewish people, I would be very scared of Ben-Gvir. Because what this is, is a land for the Jews, as long as they're the right Jews, defined halachically according to our premise of politics. So I actually want to get back to um, conversion and what Ben-Gvir might potentially do to the law of return and his view of LGBT community and reform Jews in, in a couple of minutes. It's where I want to go eventually. I think we can make a, a stronger argument to some extent, right? So let's let's do almost what Haraam did and move from Jews to Judaism and think about what Ben Gavir means to Judaism, right? It's sort of a, a bird's eye picture of Jewish tradition alongside Jewish history. There's always been a sort of radical fundamentalist -y with a political violence bent within Judaism from the beginning. Right. We can read stories in the Tanakh, right? Stories, you know, from the book of Yahushua, right, all the way through the books of Shmuel and Malachim. And there's always been this sort of element of we just need to eradicate everybody who's not us. And that's always, on the other hand, and right across sort of the city, been rebuffed by what I'll call the more prophetic element, right? The universalism of Yeshayahu, Isaiah, Amos, Yechezkel, right? All of this sort of prophets. And these two sort of poles continues in sort of this endless dialectic of Jewish history, right? We can talk about the Hasmonians, right? And the Maccabees of the Hanukkah story. And then subsequently, once the Talmud was being discussed and written, the rabbis and the Mishnah basically trying to purposely close the door on Hanukkah and almost pretend that it doesn't exist. Famously, only mentioning Hanukkah, I think, twice in the entirety of the Mishnah, and then only talking about it for about one page in the Gemara, basically talking about the miracle of the lights instead of any military victory, right? So Judaism sort of always had this dance and Jewish tradition for most of its history has actually really tried to squash the sort of intense militaristic particular element that really any group of people with an ideology and with weapons can, can probably have come to. I think Ben Gavir to some extent represents the greatest fear that most people in the Jewish world had at the outset of Zionism. And even if they don't realize it, I mean, right today, most of the ultra-Orthodox world famously will not say that they're, they're Zionists. And right, the reason often given is that, right, really a twofold reason. One, you know, only the Mashiach can redeem the state of Israel. But really, I actually don't think that's the real reason. I think the real reason is that Israel is not a halachic state. Mm -hmm. And so to some extent, right, what the Haredim are worried about and what other, let's say, more secular Jewish or liberal Jewish critiques of Israel, such as George Steiner, right, a famous literary critic in the 20th century that was sort of very weary about Zionism, was that Judaism, to some extent, can exist as this pure thing in the diaspora, to some extent. And maybe pure meaning it's not realistic because Jews are sort of, Judaism is a sort of endless fleeting thing. And when you don't actually have to get into the nitty gritty bureaucratic politics and you don't actually have to figure out how to defend your borders, you can sort of have these idealistic views of treat the stranger well because you were once strangers. Well, that's really great until strangers start showing up to your house, right? <laughs> it's really nice that every year on Pesach, we say, you know, we were once strangers in Egypt. So therefore we have moral responsibility towards strangers if we're sitting in Poland and me and you have no money and we know that if a stranger shows up, no matter what, we are worse off than that stranger, right? Right, 
Oh, it's different oh, with a stranger as a refugee yeah, right. fleeing to all, your country. All this is to say, right, there's a there's a complicated dance or ethics of power that I think has to be considered from a very philosophically mature level. And I think Jewish tradition actually does take very philosophically mature stances towards power, right? I don't think Judaism thinks power ipso facto corrupts, although Jewish tradition certainly sees power's potential to corrupt. And Ben Gavir, to some extent, is the complete throwing out of the wider meta ethos of Jewish tradition in the face of political extremism and ex expediency to some extent, right? Oh, it's inconvenient that we have, you know, this is the same, true with Merrick Ahana also, right? Ironically, Merrick Ahana called his ideology Torah Judaism. And in his quote unquote, I'm using quotes for people who uh, can't see us, he cherry picked verses from the Tanakh and the Talmud and the medieval commentaries, basically arguing for the most ethnocentric version of Judaism that can possibly be cherry picked from sources. Now, of course, other Jewish groups do this too, right? I'd be lying if I didn't say the reform community also cherry picks sort of the most liberal and universalistic of, of verses, right? And I've actually oftentimes otherwise critiqued, you know, elements of the liberal Jewish community for their picking and choosing of Jewish tradition. But when they pick and choose, it's in the element of universalism and liberalism, right? right? This is not just, I, I would argue, bad for the Jews, as we can go on for a second, but a complete bastardization of, of Judaism, meaning this is everything that I think Jewish thinkers that have been intellectually mature, that have been seriously considering the potential pathologies of power were, were worried about. And just one, one thing I'll say here, and then we'll sort of move on to a well, social policy is- I'm going to have what to say to perfect, what before perfect. you move on, just FYI. So it, it you know, the uh, Kuzari was a famous Jewish philosophical work written in Spain by Yehuda Halevi, who was sort of a famous poet and philosopher right at the golden age of Spain. And the entire Kuzari is basically a fictional philosophic account of the Khazar king talking to basically a Jew, a Christian and Muslim. And they're basically, you know, arguing about which is the best religion, quote unquote, right? This is what made for, I guess, 12th century philosophic reading. And in it, the rabbi, right, makes the case for Judaism being quote unquote better. Again, this is the 12th century work saying this and saying, you know, if you look around in the Christians and Muslim world, there's a lot of religious violence, right? The Christians are basically conquering all of Europe, right? This was, of course, right after the Crusades. The Islamic world, right, maybe they're not as destructive and violent as the Christians, but they certainly have contributed to violence. And, you know, we also can see that in Spain. But the Jews are a peaceful people. And Yehuda Halevi, you know, obviously he's writing both sides of this. So he's he writes as the Khazar king. The Khazar king basically responds, this is only because the Jews have no power. But if the Jews have, if the Jews would have had power, they too would have slayed. And this is sort of a, a mic drop and sort of open rhetorical question that of course took about 700 years to be answered in any capacity. And now, right, this is really the first time to any extent that Jews have political and military power in really 2000 years. And it's deeply troubling. I mean, this is sort of, you know, we can talk about all the debates about, you know, should we, should one be religious? Should they not? You know, is there purpose in Jewish tradition? Is there not purpose? To me, people like Ben Gavir amount to more of a shock and more of a challenge to my core religious philosophy than any amount of arguing with, you know, Richard Dawkins or, or atheists, you right. know, could. But what's important to also sort of to note is exactly as you're saying that Ben Gvir and his political ally, Vitaly Smotrich, and his political ally, Avi Moz, the three parties that came together in order to create the religious Zionist party, they don't claim to only be talking in the name of religion which is important, right? The whole concept of religious Zionism, that's where it's different than Haredi, who don't call them Zionism, they're religious. So they can advocate that they are only speaking in terms of religion, which is of course not true, but setting that aside for a minute, at least in the rhetoric, as you were saying, they won't call themselves Zionists. Zionism unto itself is a movement, as we were saying before, that's supposed to include secular Judaism. So it includes by definition, when started by secular Judaism, let's put that out there. So by definition, it already takes political considerations and ideas of nationalisms and nations, things that are not originating from Judaism, nothing to do with halakha, into consideration. Importantly, right, 
the religious Zionist movement is represented in Israel by people who are called, who call themselves Dati Leumi, by definition, religious national. Right? That by definition saying it's not just religious, it is taking into consideration the national elements and how they play out and where this balance is found. Now, one of the things that are important about the political development of the Dati Lumi movement, and I'm talking just in terms of their political parties, not the, not so much the sociological developments which we could talk about. One of the things that are important to realize is that the Tsiruta Datit, the current version of the Smotrich, Ben Gvir, Avi Mao's party, as you said, is not where it started. It's not the original Rav Kook ideas. Those were sort of embodied in the Mafdal movement, which was a lot less militant, which did not take upon itself even the, the settler project until the later 70s. And this morphed more and more and more until there was an actual split within them. In 2013, they became the Jewish home. This was represented by Bennett and Ayelet Shaked. And then gradually, already in 2017, 2018, 2019, the movement split between those who were still calling themselves religious Zionists, but they were more on the pragmatic, we need to find a way also to live within the country and find a way to talk to the left, find a way to talk to the liberals, find a way to talk to the reform, find a way to talk to other people within the element, still in the name of religious Zionism. And the Smotrich party, which was called the Hudlumi, which broke off because they were taking more of what's called the Khardali movement. And what that is, if you think about it for a minute, is a combination of the Haredi and the Datileumi. So they're known as Khardalim. And that's really the movement that's come about. So it's a movement that is explicitly saying religious Zionism is adhering too far as a concept, not the party. Religious Zionism is adhering too far to practical elements, to the nationalist elements, to maybe humanistic elements, elements that are, don't originate from Judaism. And we need to swing back the other way and emphasize far more the religious extremist aspect of it. That is not just finding these universal practicalities of how can we possibly moderate or where can we find nuances. No, we need to actually find the elements on the other side. And that's the basis for the coming together of these three parties, which I will just say one, not one, not one sentence, but a few very short sentences about. So Samadrich's party is a party that emphasizes, again, he's the leader of the religious Zionism party, party that emphasizes the need to annex the West Bank. So effectively, to take over the West Bank politically and at the same time make sure the Palestinians there are not made citizens, which would create a big problem internationally because that is to some extent the definition of, of apartheid. So that's his party. That comes alongside Avi Moza's party, which is called Noam, which is a party that explicitly says that LGBTQ communities in Israel should have no rights. And to some extent, in some circles, has also said the practice of homosexuality should be illegal in Israel, in the name of religion, alongside Ben Gvir's Jewish Power Party, which emphasizes the Kahanist idea that within Israel there should be supremacy of the Jews. So all this, you're absolutely right, is not supposed to be the original ideas of peaceful Judaism, and not even the original ideas of, of Rav Kook of how can we bring religion into a nationalist element. This is a swing to the other side that has then brought together a conglomeration of these three parties that really each represent a different facet of right-wing radicalism. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. And I think the point from before still stands that Judaism to some extent or a selective reading of Jewish tradition is sadly a, a common element behind here with all of the caveats, of course, Absolutely. that I think historically and current, right, neatly dissecting out a thing we call religion, which is really just some 18th century Protestant slash academic -y word <laughs> from this thing we call nationalism, which is also an 18th or 19th century academic -y word, right? These things don't actually exist as sort of pure ideal types out in nature, right? At, the real at world. At least we make up of, words in academia. That is true. Well, Judaism, we also make up words. Um, so going off that, just the, the last thing, you know, that I, I wanted to discuss is a lot of those, those social policies of religious Zionism. Those already, I think, you know, this morning we are here recording on Sunday, November 13th. This morning I woke up to news reports that 
talk about Ben Gavir trying to change the law of return in Israel, right? And so for those who, you know, don't know a little brief history, right? One of the things that Israel was founded on, right, was this idea that it's going to be a safe haven for Jewish people, which of course begged the most fundamental question that Jews have been asking ourselves for hundreds, if not thousands of years, which is, what is a Jew? And so Israel famously in the early 1950s defined Judaism based off of the Nuremberg laws, right? Which is if you have one Jewish grandparent and there's, you know, some, some gray areas around there, but for the purpose of this, let's keep it simple. If you have one Jewish grandparent, you are Jewish for the purpose of the right of return and you can automatically obtain citizenship in Israel. Now, the reason why Israel did this is sort of obvious, right? The people who were affected and killed as Jews were people with one Jewish grandparent and political Zionism creating a home of physical safety for Jews, right? You need to protect the people that are going to be hated as Jews. Now, all of a sudden, and you know, not all of a sudden, right? Of course, for the last 70 years, there's been debate and discussion about the law of return, right? Why should we model it after Hitler? Why shouldn't we model it after something else? But it's basically stayed consistent. What does this sort of represent, this sort of trying to change the law of return and who's considered Jewish for the purpose of Israeli citizenship? How how important is this? You know, what is this sort of signal? So it's a very good question because it does actually strike, a, as you said, the core of the Zionist mission and the idea of a homeland for the Jewish people. Um, and it is, again, as you said, extremely interesting that it is the more religious elements within the Knesset that are actually pushing to redefine this in order to limit who will be considered Jewish for the purposes of the state. Um, the push to change the law of return has come in right now in coalition negotiations from two sides. So the one side is, as you said, Ben Gvir, who this morning tweeted that he would demand of Netanyahu that the law of return be changed in order to explicitly say that only Jews that are that undergo halachic conversion are recognized as Jews. So either you, oh sorry, only Jews that are recognized halachically as yeah. Jews will be, will be Jews. So either you're born into it from a Jewish mother, and that Jewish mother has to, of course, be recognized halachically, it can't be that she underwent some sort of conservative reform conversion or identified as Jews or whatever, or you undergo sort of the more extreme versions of conversion rather than what is much more popular in the world today, reform and conservative conversion. So that's his push from Ben Gvir's party. At the same time, a different push is being brought up from United Torah Judaism, the Haredi party, to change the law of return entirely and say, that the law of return should not include Jewish grandparents, should only include Jewish parents. The reason is that the Haredi parties have been lamenting for years, specifically for 30 years since the great sort of immigration from the former Soviet Union, that a lot of people came to Israel that had nothing to do with Judaism, but they had a Jewish grandparent. And these people largely support secular parties. They support Lieberman's party, which is a staunchly secular party. They do not see Israel as a land that should be governed by any religious laws. It was during the 90s that all of a sudden the immigrants of the former Soviet Union started to push in order to allow for pork to be sold in Israel or to allow for restaurants to be open on, on Shabbat, all kinds of things like that. So there's a big political interest in saying the law of return should be limited to if you have a Jewish parent rather than a Jewish grandparent, because this will stop an influx as far as they, as far as Haredi parties see of people who are getting citizenship, even though they themselves have very little to do with Judaism. So, so what's 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 interesting, and this is sort of, you know, we can obviously talk about the rise of right-wing nationalism and sort of the, you know, stereotype of, of nationalistic movements is we only care about our country and not others, right? You know, let's pick the most uh, cartoonish version. What's interesting is Israeli nationalism to some extent is not, you know, in some way is a Jewish supremacy movement in terms of the Jews are better. But to another extent, they're actually content with throwing, let's say at least 30 to 40% of diasporic Jews to the wayside also. And of course, their rebuttal to that, if, you know, we had a Ben Gavir supporter sitting here would be like, well, they're not Jewish. But there's sort of a wider issue here, which is this Either they're is- not Jewish or they're not, they're not supportive of the Jewish mission. 
I would say. Sure. Even if even if they're not Jewish, yeah. But if you're a Jew living a good life in Ireland, okay, so that means that you're not, as you said, you're not serving the army, you're not one of us. So go go be Jewish however you want to be, but you don't actually, you're not a part of the Zionist mission. No, no, of course. But th- th- this, this was all just to say, this is a complete giving up on the underpinnings of political Zionism. Mm-hmm. Meaning Absolutely. any any ethical defense of Zionism, and I, I do consider myself a Zionist, you know, and one of the reasons why is because of the political, def- is because of the moral defense of political Zionism. The Jews, since the 1800s, since emancipation in Europe, even though on paper they were given equal rights, were never treated as a population that had equal rights, right? There was still systemic anti-Semitism, as we would say, throughout the Western and now throughout the global world. And so therefore, the only way to ensure the current or future safety of the Jewish people was self-autonomy, right? This is the most fundamental definition of Herzl's political Zionism, right? Obviously, it's morphed and, and changed a little bit. Saying that, you know, oh, if you don't fit my definition of, of Judaism, you're not welcome here, is a, is giving up on that entire, you know, foundation and, and pillar of Zionism. So I, I just wanted to throw that out there. The other thing that, of course, you had mentioned before that this party is trying to do is, again, Israel had been slowly, you know, I'm wondering if you'll agree with this classification, been slowly becoming more and more open to non-Orthodox movements, Mm -hmm. right? By non-Orthodox, I mean mostly reform, right? We'll talk about reform for the purposes of here, right? Not that, you know, the Rabbanut, you know, the ultra-Orthodox controlled Rabbanut were, you know, getting ready to ordain women. But over the last, you know, 20, 30 years, as I've been sort of very closely following this, there's been sort of a wider acceptance, both in terms of if you actually poll Jews in Israel in terms of feelings of, of reform, again, not high by any by any means, but has been growing. And in terms of policy, has been getting better and better. And this seems like we are just going to, you know, we sort of almost hit a peak and now we are going straight down, down. Straight, straight down the other side. Do you think that this sort of rebuff to this growing acceptance of reform, will this continue? Do you think there's going to be a backlash to this? I'm just curious, you know, what your sort of uh, future prediction is here. I think that we are going to see an amazing, as you said, cascade um, down in um, in this openness and acceptance. Um, and we've seen this in the past. In the 1990s, um, Meretz and a party called Shinui, which was actually run by um, Lapid's father, Tommy Lapid, sort of pledged to stop uh, or to fight against the rabbinical establishment. Uh, Shulamit Aloni became Minister of Education, famously said, the reign of the popes is over um, in the 1990s because we were gonna, they were going to fight and stop the control of the religious establishment over the definitions of marriage, over the definitions of kosherness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This did have a backlash, and we saw the, uh, the rising strength of Haredi parties in response. What has happened now over the years, as you said, is there has been a simple simply responding to what's happening in the population, which is the secular population in Israel, has started to more and more disengage from the religious establishment. So there's a lot of people in Israel who simply do not get married legally in Israel, but they get married illegally um, and are not recognized as married just because they refuse to go through the rabbinical establishment. I, by the way, am one of them, um, et cetera, et cetera. So because of this, there have been all kinds of ways that the government over the years, specifically the Netanyahu governments, have tried to not alienate this population and therefore try to find some compromise with the rabbinical establishment, have tried to find some compromise of saying we won't recognize the concept of marriage outside of the rabbinut, but we will recognize sort of a very, very expanded version of common law marriage um, and things like that. And that has opened up also to the reform movement and all kinds of processes like that. What happened, though, is in this latest government, um, prior to the current government that's going to come in now. So in the last year, the Bennett and Lapid government was the first time in the last 20 odd years, with the exception of a brief two-year period, that the old Orthodox parties, the Haredi parties, were not in government. It was the first time. And in response, the minister of religion was all of a sudden from the more religious Zionism ilk. And all of a sudden, they did a lot of moves that were meant to fight the sort of iron grip and monopoly that the Orthodox Rabbanut has. So they started opening up things like 
you could get kosher certificates not just from the one rabbinical establishment, which happens to be led also by the family of, families of the most of the strongest ultra orthodox powers, and etc. 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 They started opening up the idea to reform conversion, and now the Haredi parties are coming back. They want to lock in to, as you said, basic laws. This idea that like no, this is going to be the situation that's going to be under the orthodox um, establishment, and it's going to be here to stay because the status quo that has been up until now, where everyone knows that the rabbinical establishment has this power, but there's some incremental change here and there within this framework, all of a sudden was ha- was broken. And so there's now going to be a very big backlash, I foresee, against that, which is why all of a sudden they're making demands that have never been made before to change the law of return, to lock into basic laws the idea of only the rabbinical establishment can be the one to give kosher certificates, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there's almost a uncanny comparison when we you know, just glimpse where we're at in sort of our weekly Torah portion, our weekly Parsha cycle to some extent, where we're right now in the middle of the story of Avraham. And perhaps it's just the nature of Torah reading that every year you read it and you sort of gain new insights. But there's a fascinating reading from last week's Parsha, Parsha Vayera, where, of course, we have the infamous story of Avraham kicking out his Arab midwife, Hagar, and his and her son, Ishmael, who sort of becomes the father of the Arab people. And the reading suggests that actually, if we look at the story that happens right after, Avraham kicks out Hagar and Ishmael. The story right after is the Akedah, where Avraham is now asked to kill his son, whom Mm -hmm. he's described as loving. And the interpretation goes as such, right? You think that by kicking down at other people and by pointing other people and, and othering them, and even expelling elements of your family, your society, you know, humanity who you don't like, you think it's going to create a safer and a better world for you and your family. But look at the natural consequence, right? Once you find some blood sheep, it's only a matter of time until you go after your own child. And even though Avraham, of course, never went ahead with it, and even though God at the last minute basically had to jump in there and stop Avraham, we know that Sarah dies right as a result from this horrific incident. And I think, the, you know, just on on my end, I think this is Sad, but also a, a perfect way to sort of end this wider conversation about Israeli elections and Itabar ben Gavir, where you probably feel like there's a battle for the soul of Israel. And I feel like there's a battle for the soul of Torah and the soul of Judaism. And hopefully, you know, the road is the road is rocky. You know, I think, you know, we have we have many other partiot in the Torah until we are <laughs> uh, metaphorically cross over to the promised land. And famously, the Torah ends right before we cross over to the promised land. So maybe that's the... Uh, and the lift was left up to, was left up to us. Yes, it, exactly. But maybe that's the point. So ho- hopefully, you know, saner heads and can can prevail both in terms of the politics and in terms of the uh, Jewishness of the Saul. Um, Dr. Owen Bursi, and thank you so much for coming on J Life with Daniel. Thank you for having me and uh, see you in the next elections. <laughs>